What specifically about this computational approach seems so compelling to you? What made you look at it and go, ah, this could be right? That's really interesting. So it was a couple of things. Okay, the, the, the first thing to say is that I think there's, there's a, a very common philosophical confusion that happens when people think about models. People very often confuse the kind of substrate of a model for some kind of statement about ontology, right? So this is a confusion that's, that's you know, plagued, that's been replete in the, in the, in the history of science. So, Absolutely. you know, the, the, the kind of the, the Newtonian paradigm, which oddly enough is quite what we now call the Newtonian paradigm, which is really a French concept, is quite different from what Newton himself thought, but whatever. Yeah. So the, the Newtonian paradigm was really based on this kind of Descartes, you know, Cartesian idea of a clockwork universe, right? Where you talk yeah. about physical processes in terms, of, in terms of mechanisms, in terms of clockwork. When one talks about that, no one is seriously saying that, you know, the universe is actually a piece of clockwork. It's that yeah. this, is, this is a useful thinking tool for, for, for kind of for formulating a model. But it's not really a statement about the actual ontology. And that, I think, teaches us an important lesson, which is that the, that the models that are the, the, the most useful thinking tools are generally the models that use concepts from ambient technology. So, you know, the, the, the 17th century was really the height of clockwork. And so it's unsurprising that the analogies for how the universe works were all based on clockwork. But, you know, we now live in the 21st century. The ambient technology is no longer, oh, the, the kind of most up-to-date ambient technology is no longer clockwork, it's computation. And so it seemed obvious, at least to me, that we should, you know, just as Newton, or at least people who interpreted Newton, sort of in, in, interpreted what he was doing as kind of an, an, an attempt to place the mechanism of the universe within this kind of this, this, this clockwork paradigm, it seemed obvious that kind of we should be attempting to do the same, but with the computational paradigm in the 21st century. Yes. Again, it's important to be clear because this is something which a lot of people, and I, I know, I think, I think you addressed this in your, in your last video about the, you know, you're skeptical about whether there is a kind of big exactly. computer that's actually enacting these rules. And it's, yes. it's a really important point to make because a lot of people, when they, when they first hear the ideas of the physics project, say, oh, well, we live in a simulation or, ah, oh, the universe is a <laughs> yes. computer. Not realizing that it's, that, that it's very different. Saying the universe is computational is an extremely different statement from saying the universe is a computer, like saying the universe yes. is mathematical, right? So it's undoubtedly true the universe is mathematical. The universe is well described by mathematical equations. But it doesn't mean that, you know, inside every, every planet is some, you know, some person or some mathematica kernel or whatever solving the differential equations of, of celestial mechanics. It's, it just means that this is a, you know, this is a useful way of encoding you know, the, the, the abstract states of our model onto concrete physical states of some system. And I think the same is true of computation. And in fact, there's a precise sense in which computation is a more general paradigm than these, because universality of computation, if you like, explains why the mathematical paradigm and other things actually work, because it's, you know, in yeah. effect, what it's telling you is that the, the axioms of mathematics are capable of universal computation. And so when we do mathematical physics, all we're doing is we're effectively simulating the computation that is our universe with the computation that is mathematics grown from these, you know, grown, grown out of these axiomatic systems. So there was a, there was a kind of largely philosophical point that, that, that it just, you know, it seemed like if we really wanted to make progress in physics, then, you know, an obvious thing to do was, would, would be to build models that made better use of the ambient technology that we have, not necessarily making direct use of the technology itself, but making use yeah. of the ideas that the, the, the technology kind of encodes yeah. as, as sort of raw primitives for building those models. Then there was another thing, which, um, which is not unrelated, but I think is a slightly different point, which is, for me, the way I like to think about the physics project is not so much that it's a quest to find the fundamental theory of physics, although, of course, if, we, if it does, then that would be wonderful. It's more, it's a kind of way of answering a counterfactual history question. We historically have tended to formulate laws of physics in terms of continuous mathematical structures, in terms of yep. differential equations, in terms of manifolds, in terms of smooth functions, all these kinds of things. And our choice of mathematical formalism has kind of percolated and seeped into our intuition. So we actually think of, we generally think of space-time as being smooth. We think of it as being continuous. We think of particles as having, you know, as being able to exist in a continuum of different positions and momenta. We think of Hilbert spaces, spaces of quantum states, as actually being kind of smooth projective spaces, etc. But really, there's no physical reason to believe that's true. And, you know, obviously, yeah. Democritus and Locke and Bishop Berkeley and lots of other people throughout history have kind of you know, have taken issue with this idea that you know, they, people have advocated corpuscularianism or atomism or these other views in which there is some kind of underlying discretization of nature. So it's an interesting question to ask, well, why have all of our, why have all of our best models of physics been continuous? 
And again, I don't think it's because the universe is necessarily continuous and that's what's really being reflected. I think it's a consequence of the fact that, if you like, because Newton was born about 300 years before Turing, we yeah. had in, the, in calculus and analysis and you know, the things that were built off that, we had a systematic approach for analyzing continuous mathematical structures about 300 years or 250 years or so before we had a systematic procedure for investigating discrete mathematical structures, i.e. Turing machines, lambda calculus, recursively enumerable functions, all those kinds of things. And so the way that I personally like to think about the physics project is that in a sense it's a way of answering or at least addressing the counterfactual history question of what would have happened if Turing was born 300 years before Newton? What would have happened if we had, you know, systematic approaches for discrete math long before we had systematic approaches for continuous math? And that has, again, a bunch of other implications about, you know, like, uh, for things like, uh, there are some uh, more philosophical ways that you can couch the same idea that, you you know, it's only relatively recently in from 20th century mathematical logic that people have kind of started talking about these ideas of constructivism, right? The idea that that in, in the foundations of mathematics, that, you know, the, the only proofs that you should kind of allow and that, that you should consider to be meaningful are ones that are constructive, right? If you want to reason yeah. about some mathematical structure, you should actually give some finite deterministic algorithm that builds that structure. Because otherwise, if you just reason about it purely abstractly using the axioms, then you're assuming kind of consistency of the underlying axioms in a way that, you know, the incompleteness theorems and things tell us you can't do in general. Yeah. And so there was this sort of philosophical movement that has its origins in with people like Brouwer and Hilbert, that, that kind of that seeped into the foundations of mathematics, this idea that you should build constructivist foundations, not just abstract axiomatic ones. And for some reason, that view never really permeated physics. Yeah. And again, one of the ways that I like to think about the physics project from a more philosophical standpoint is that it's a way of kind of, just as Brouwer's intuitionism, if you like, was a way of building a constructivist foundation for mathematics, I kind of view the Wolfram model as being a way of building a constructivist foundation for physics. Yeah. So there are various reasons why it sort of appealed to me, both aesthetically and, and philosophically, but those are maybe a, a, a handful. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's so much that you went into there that I really wanted to get into. I'll maybe kind of interject in, in some of these conversations, just some definitions, like the definition of ontology for people who don't know what that is. It's basically the philosophy of what exists. So what we're talking about here is what actually exists in the universe. And if you're modeling the universe in terms of a hypergraph, does that hypergraph actually exist? And I think your point of view, Jonathan, is your agnostic as to that. It's sort of like a non-question. Does the hypergraph really exist? Well, it kind of doesn't matter. The, the more interesting question is, if you assume that the universe is a hypergraph, what would the universe look like? And you can build up an entire physics based on that and then compare it with our universe and see if it matches. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really good summary. And, and in fact... Yeah, I, 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 precisely. I would say I'm broadly agnostic, and I, I wouldn't even be surprised if it ultimately turned out that there was a that there's okay. One interesting question is: Could you even tell, in principle, right, if the universe was yes. was continuous or discrete? And it's entirely plausible that the answer is no. That actually, for, for you as a macroscopic observer, a, a universe based on a discrete underlying hypergraph and a universe based on a continuous underlying space time are really observationally kind of isomorphic, that they are observationally yes. equivalent. You know, for instance, one rather amusing way that that could happen is if you have a hypergraph that's kind of progressively subdividing, which is kind of one version of the model that, that one can consider, yeah. you, could ha you could have a situation where it's kind of constantly running away from you. So you, you build your experiment, you build your particle accelerator or whatever to test for discretization at scale x. And maybe there was discretization at scale x, but by the time you've built your, your experiment, it's now subdivided, and so now the discretization is at a much smaller scale. So if you imagine a universe like that, there are, ways, there are actually situations in which you can prove formally that no experiment that you could in principle do would be able to distinguish whether the universe was discrete or continuous. And so, yeah, exactly yes. as you say, I think, therefore, the operative question is not so much what, you know, is the universe a hypergraph? Or is the universe a, an X or a Y? It's, yeah, exactly as you say. If we, start, if we use a hypergraph as the kind of underlying data structure, does that let us do useful stuff that would be harder to do if we assumed a different data structure like, spa like a continuous spacetime? Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.